I held my trusty assault rifle with a light grab, leaning back against the inside of the vehicle. I couldn't see where we were going, but the ride was pretty smooth, so I figured we were at least not going to an overly remote area. It's been a while since my last mission, and this long drive oddly reminded me of my first intervention with the unit. I was nervous back then, and my commander noticed that, so he told me to pull myself together, because in this line of work, one moment of panic could get your team members or yourself killed. I listened to him, and I focused as best as I could, and in the end, the mission was a success, with no incurred losses. I'd been on countless missions since then, and as I now rode in the APC, I felt nothing similar to that rookie-like nervousness like on my first mission. We'll be there in around five minutes. Get ready. The driver said from the front seat. Roger that. Unit Leader Jones said and turned to us. Safety's off and let's go over the mission details once more. I took my safety off as he commanded and returned to my previous leaning position now holding my gun a little tighter. The unit leader and my other two team members, Bryans and Torres, were leaning forward, visibly on edge. So what do we do now? Bryans asked. The unit leader placed the butt of his gun on the floor, pointing it upwards and said, We've had radio silence from the guards of the campus for over two hours now. There is five of them, and they're supposed to report every hour to HQ. For some reason though, all five of them went to radio silent at the same time, and haven't been responsive since. It's almost 2am on a Friday night, Torres shrugged. Maybe they just fell asleep or got drunk. HQ could have given them another hour or so before they started bothering us. There's a reason for them reporting so frequently, Torres. The unit leader rebutted. The college campus is a highly sensitive area, and as soon as there's something suspicious going on there, HQ needs to take action. And if all five of them somehow did fall asleep at the same time, or showed up for duty drunk, they'll have a lot more to worry about than just losing their jobs. So, what's our objective? I asked calmly, causing the other unit members to jerk their head towards me. Joan said, Head to the nearest guardhouse near the parking lot and assess the situation. If the guard is there, get intel on what had happened. If he's not, we'll have to go in. Are we getting support from any other units? I asked. Jones shook his head. There is not enough manpower right now. Team Alpha is out on another mission, and the other teams are too crucial for the areas they've been assigned to. They need to be there in case there's an incident. But the campus is huge. How the hell are we supposed to investigate the whole place? Torres asked. The truck slowed down and then halted to a stop. The driver killed the engine, instantly shrouding us in complete silence. We're here, he said. The unit leader looked at Torres and said, That's our job. The back door of the APC swung open, streetlights instantly bathing the vehicle interior in orange light. I got out after my team members and I scanned the area. We were in a parking lot which was all but empty, save for four parked cars, which I assumed belonged to the college guards and some other night staff. There is a toll gate right next to the guardhouse in front of us, surrounded by a tall fence on both sides stretching far beyond our view. This marked the entrance to the campus. The fence made it seem more like a prison than a college, which made me wonder if that was the impression they were trying to give. The inside of the actual campus was coupled with tall trees, various paved paths, and university buildings, while the outside area was surrounded by thick woods, making the college completely cut off from civilization. There is a single road leading through the woods back into the city, and it took us around 20 minutes to arrive from HQ to the university grounds, so a lot could have happened in the meantime. 
I glanced at the guardhouse and realized that it was empty, despite the lights being left on. No time to waste. Let's move. Jones said and he took point. He raised his gun before even reaching the toll gate, ready to shoot. The unit was authorized to use a lethal force in case we thought we were in any danger. And more often than not, we returned home with fewer bullets than at the beginning of the mission. The rest of us followed the leader's lead, getting into formation and carefully observing our surroundings. As we got closer to the guardhouse, we realized that something was very wrong over there. The four of us entered the guardhouse, still gripping our guns firmly. The handset of the phone dangled on its cord off the table, slowly swinging back and forth in steady motion, indicating that someone had been there just recently. The chair was overturned on the floor, and there were fresh bloodstains on it and on the floor next to it. Upon closer inspection, I realized there was blood on the phone handset as well, in the form of bloody fingerprints. The amount of blood in the room didn't seem like the type of injury that you get from cutting yourself on a tuna can while having a meal. So we knew right there and then that we were in for a mess on our hands. The hell happened here? Torres asked. Jones lowered his gun, looking around the room. I approached the desk and I leaned in to take a look at the monitor, which had the camera feed. There is a blood stain on the screen, covering one feed partially. From the dozens of camera feeds on the screen, it became apparent that the whole university was being monitored. I looked around and I saw no movement on any of the cameras, but as I scanned through, I saw one of the guards on the feed marked as Lab East, strewn on the floor of the hallway, on his back with arms and legs spread, dark liquid stained the floor beneath him. Damn, that's the guard assigned to secure the eastern perimeter of the campus, Brian said tonelessly. Just then, I saw movement on one of the cameras covering the science building. It was one of the guards sprinting through the hallway. Although the footage was not clear on this particular camera, the guard was visibly scared for his life based on his body language. He ran in a frantic, panicked motion by flailing his arms and taking unsteady steps, glancing over his shoulder every second or so. When he rounded the corner, he stopped and peeked around and then instantly backed away in terror. He opened one of the lockers and quickly hid inside. A few seconds later, Something else appeared on the same feed. I couldn't tell who it was though because as soon as he did, the camera started acting up, making it almost impossible to see anything. The strange thing was, everything else on the camera seemed fine, but wherever the person moved, the area would just become pixelated and grainy just in that spot. The camera continued acting up for at least a whole minute as the person made his way randomly around the hallway. Our unit members stared, transfixed in anticipation. Eventually, the person walked off the visibility of the camera, and the fee returned back to normal, as we were faced again with the view of the lockers. Another half a minute or so later, the guard emerged from his locker timidly, looking in both directions. He quietly closed the locker door. Jones pressed the button on his radio and said as quietly as possible, This is the special response unit. Is anybody out there? The guard seemed to notice this as he grabbed his radio and said something into it. Jones waited for a moment but no response came back. He tried asking again if anybody out there had heard him. Nothing but silence. And then something came through. At first, it was a second or so of static. And then we heard a male voice breaking up. The art from Duen Science Bit. Repeat that last. You cut off. Where are you? Jones asked sternly. Go and the 
dance building. Just then, a loud, ear-piercing, animalistic shriek came from the other end of the radio. So sharp and long that I felt shivers running down my spine, even at this distance. The guard on the camera shot his head in the direction down the hallway and started running again, faster and more panicked than before. This is Unit Leader Jones. You there in the science building. Can you hear me? There is another staticky noise, coupled with the sound of broken up panting and that same monstrous screeching, before it went silent completely. The camera started acting up at the same time as well and we were unable to see where the guard had run off to and what was chasing him. We stared at the motionless, quiet camera feed for a minute or so, before I finally turned away from the screen. You mentioned the science building, I said. We should check that place out first. We might want to call for backup, Torres stated. You know the drill, Joan said. No backup until we can confirm what we're up against. Brian, you stay here and monitor the feed. Keep us informed of any movement. Got it? Roger that. Brian nodded and immediately lifted the chair and sat by the desk. The two of you, you're coming with me. We gotta see if we can save that other guard and get some intel from him, Joan said. We quickly checked out the map on the wall of the guardhouse, which showed where each point of interest in the campus was located. The science building was pretty close to the guardhouse itself, to our relief, since the campus was enormous. Let's move, Joan said and opened the door. The outside was unnervingly quiet as we made our way there. Even the chirping of birds and insects was not heard, leaving us with nothing but the sound of our own boots echoing on pavement. With our years of training and the kinds of missions that we'd been on before, we knew better than to let our guard down, so I kept an eye on the left side, while Torres did the same on the right side. Jones took point and made sure nothing expected had jumped out in front of us. The science building stood in front of us, a silent behemoth, four floors tall. Some of the classrooms still had lights on, but most of them were engulfed in pitch darkness. Brian, anything moving in there? Jones asked as we neared the statue of a prominent scientist in front of the building. Negative. No sign of the guard either. Brian's voice came over in reply. All right, let's move. Jones opened the front door and the three of us burst inside, pointing our guns with flashlights in various directions, illuminating the hallway and lockers in front. As soon as we had stepped inside the building, the air suddenly felt extremely heavy, like stepping from a cold room into a sauna. Not physically, mind you, but in some way I can't really explain to this day. I usually didn't feel anything except adrenaline on a mission like these, but for some reason, this time, every fiber of my being was screaming at me to get out of there. I couldn't do that, however. I had a mission to complete and that guard I needed rescuing. The unit leader took point and I followed him as he motioned for us to stay close, quietly taking step by step forward, never letting his guard down. The general rule for the unit was to avoid speaking while on a mission, unless it was absolutely safe since it could give away our position, and so Jones referred it to hand signals instead. We hadn't made it halfway down the hallway when a loud bang resounded somewhere in the distance. Jones raised his hand to signal for us to stop. We stood there in silence with our guns raised, pointing them at the far end of the hallway, covering both the left and right side where the corridor forked. And then we saw something run past us from left to right, with an insanely quick batter of barefoot footsteps disappearing around the corner. I'm not even sure that the word run is the right one in this case because whatever it was that ran past us was so quick that you could literally miss it if you had blinked. 
What the hell was that? Torres asked, pointing his gun left to right in a confused manner. We stared without blinking, trigger fingers at the ready. Jones gently pressed the radio button and asked, Brian's, you see anything? There is a sound of static coming from the other end. Brian's, Jones repeated, but no response came. He looked genuinely unsure what the next best approach should be, but after a moment of contemplation, he signaled for us to follow him. He pointed his gun around the corner where that fast thing had disappeared and then, I honestly don't know what happened next. There was a loud screech similar to the one that we had heard on the radio, which oddly reminded me of skidding car tires, but this time it was fuller of audible malice and anger. Jones started firing, filling my ears with ringing noise, mixed with the echoing bangs of gunfire. This all lasted for two seconds tops, because as soon as Jones started firing and before Torres and I could reach him, that thing from before flew back the way it came as quickly as it did before, but this time it took Jones along with it, making the both of them disappear around the corner, just like that in a split second. It all happened so quickly that we saw Jones' rifle fall out of thin air onto the ground with a loud clang. Torres ran to the gun and pointed his own gun in the direction where the leader was taken. I followed closely behind, scanning the hallway along with him. It was empty. Rows of lockers on both sides and a hallway which ended in consuming darkness. Our flashlights unable to illuminate it all the way to the end. But other than that, there was nothing. Commander! Torres called out into the dark. Another scream echoed us somewhere in the distance, this time much longer, filling me with a primordial fear. I heard that same sound of bare feet thudding on the floor, rapidly approaching us as I knew that we had to get out of there. Torres, we gotta get the hell out now! I turned back towards the exit along with Torres and we started sprinting down the hallway. The scream resounded again, this time right to my ear and I heard a thump and a yelp, realizing Torres had somehow tripped and fallen. I turned back to help him and to my horror, saw him getting dragged down the hallway by his foot, almost as quickly as Jones, but slowly enough for me to see his face full of fear as he reached out towards me in vain and screamed futilely. I opened fire at whatever could have been dragging him, even though I saw nothing in the darkness and just before he disappeared around the corner. I saw Torres turn his back while still being dragged and shoot at his captor. The shooting lasted for a few seconds before it abruptly stopped. I stood there with my gun and pointed down the hallway, breathing heavily the beam of my flashlight steadily going up and down. I couldn't process what the hell just happened. And then a noise snapped me back from my trance into reality. It sounded like those same footsteps from before, right around the corner, but this time slow and dragged on the floor intermittently. And it was getting closer. It's coming back for you. Hide. I heard Brian's panicked voice on the radio. I couldn't make up my mind. Should I run, fight, hide? My flashlight illuminated an elongated pale hand reaching out and grabbing around the corner of the wall, with bony fingers that had jagged, dirty nails. I then heard a wheezing noise from around the corner, as if the creature had trouble breathing, while dragging its feet heavily on the ground. My instincts kicked in and I suddenly knew better than to try and fight this thing face to face. So I ran to the nearest classroom and closed the door behind me as silently as I could, ducking under just in time to hear the footsteps and wheezing get louder and stop in front of the door. I held the door firmly with my shoulder, trying not to make any movements, holding my breath. The only thing separating me from most likely assured death was this door, and the wheezing was right on the other side of it. 
so close that I could practically smell the monster's rotted breath even through the small crack under the door. It sniffed the air curiously, wheezing between sniffs. Gradually, the heavy dragging of the creature's feet started again, and it began to fade away along with the wheezing. It stopped again and a loud sound was heard outside of the classroom, like something metallic scraping against another metal surface. More footsteps and wheezing in my direction, but they simply went past the door and gradually faded away. I steadily exhaled in relief when my radio crackled to life, nearly making me jump out of my skin. They messed up, and now we're all screwed. It was an unfamiliar voice. There was a blood-curdling scream down the hall again, and a series of rapid footsteps closing in on a matter of seconds, before whatever was out there slammed directly into the classroom door. I almost fell over from the impact, but continued holding the door firmly. It was no use though, since the creature was so strong that it was only a matter of time before it busted the door open. I tried bracing the door and getting my gun ready to shoot when the creature burst in, but before I had the chance to do it, there was a loud crash somewhere in the building and the slamming on the door instantly stopped. Another screech ensued right to my ear, followed by an impossibly quick batter of footsteps which seemed to cover insurmountable distance within seconds and fade away completely. Whatever caused that crash got the creature's attention, which were to my advantage. I wasn't sure how long I had though, so I had to act quickly. It's gone now. Brian's voice came over the radio calmly. You're in the clear. Brian's, where the hell have you been? I scolded him and immediately moved to the corner of the classroom to avoid drawing the creature back. What the hell is that thing? And where are Jones and Torres? I'm sorry. Brian said over the radio. They're dead. You need to get the hell out of there. I'll call back up. Hell man, is it safe? I asked. There's no one there as far as I can see. Move your freaking ass before it comes back. I carefully exited the classroom with my gun raised, looking down the hallway and then towards the exit. As soon as I did, I couldn't help but mouth, what the hell, in frustration and bafflement. The metallic handles on the exit door had been twisted together into a knot, making it impossible to open the door. I was stuck in here. Brian's come in. The door is barred. I said into the radio looking over my shoulder. What? Brian's asked a second later. The door is barred. That thing twisted the metal handles. I can't get out. I said more frustrated this time. A moment of silence before Brian's finally responded. Shit. Alright, listen. There's a back entrance into the building. You'll have to go to the other side. Got it. Did you call back up? I did, but their ETA is one hour. Are you shitting me? There is a heavy set of footsteps on the floor above, which reminded me to lower my voice. I gripped my gun firmly and waited for them to fade away, before I spoke into the radio again, more quietly this time. One hour is too long. We'll all get killed by then. If this thing gets out, we're all done. All the other units are busy. Look, I told them how serious this situation is, and they said they'll send in the armored guys. For now, you just need to get the hell out of there. Brian said. I can't leave. There's somebody else still alive. I heard them on the radio just before. Yeah, it was probably the guard from before. He's hiding in the basement lab. You see him? Yeah, but forget about him. You need to get your ass out of there. I sighed. Negative. Backup is taking too long. I gotta pick him up before the thing gets to him and get some intel. 
Are you out of your mind? Brian's agitated voice came through. Did you see that thing in there? It took Torres and Jones. You gotta... Where's the creature now? I interrupted him. Brian's went silent for a moment before saying, Third floor. I still can't see it clearly though. It must be causing some interference with the cameras. Can you see Torres and Jones anywhere? I asked. No. They were taken off camera view. I doubt they're still alive though. Got it. I'm gonna pick up the guard. Keep me posted on the creature's movement. Roger, out. Brian said lethargically. I raised my weapon and I started down the hallway slowly, trying to make as little noise as possible. Although the building seemed empty for now, it was so dark even with my flashlight that it looked like something could jump out in front of me in an instant, especially considering the absurd speed of that creature. I remembered seeing on the map back in the guardhouse that the building's stairs were on the west side, and so I turned left. It worked out well, because in the back of my mind, I wanted to take the path where I saw Jones and Torres disappear, in hopes to at least find their bodies if nothing else. I was just about to turn around the corner when I saw bloodstains on the floor. They went in a straight line across the floor and ended out of my flashlight's reach. I slowly followed the trail, keeping a lookout in front for that creature's sudden return. And then the blood trail suddenly ended and my flashlight instead illuminated a boot. I got closer and realized that there is an entire body there, or whatever was left of it. The body was cut in the middle and literally split in half, from the crotch all the way up to the abdomen. No, more like ripped. The way the legs were spread in an unnatural way indicated that the creature may have grabbed the victim by the legs and ripped the body apart, as incredible as it sounded. But then again, seeing the speed of movement of the creature that got my teammates, it didn't seem so far-fetched. A large pool of blood and spilled guts decorated the floor around the body. I recognized the uniform and my heart sank when I pointed the flashlight at the victim's face. Joan's eyes stared blankly at the ceiling, his mouth agape in terror, trickles of dried blood on the side of his face. Holy hell! Brian's, do you read me? I said into the radio. Go ahead, Brian said. I found Jones, he's dead. I knelt down for a better view. Whatever the hell this thing was, it was capable of doing some serious damage. Shit, the creature got him. Brian's asked. I don't know. He's been ripped in half, so whatever did this isn't messing around. Shit, man. Any sign of Torres? Not that I can see of. I'll let you know if I find any signs of him. I proceeded through the hallway and just then, I heard a loud crash somewhere on my floor. I pointed my gun at the source of the sound, realizing that it must have come from one of the nearby classrooms. The cameras didn't cover any of the classrooms, so I knew asking Brian's if he could see anything would be pointless. I just stood frozen for a long moment, waiting to see if more sounds would come from the classroom. Another crash, but this time from somewhere upstairs. I knew I wouldn't feel safe with something potentially tailing me from behind, so I decided that the best course of action would be checking it out. I approached the door and I reached for the knob, gently grabbing it. As slowly as I could, I turned it and I pushed the door. It creaked in an alarmingly loud manner, revealing an empty classroom in front. I stepped inside, carefully observing my surroundings when I saw something move from behind the teacher's desk with the corner of my eye. Don't move! I pointed my gun to the source. Whoa, don't shoot! A familiar face popped out from under the desk, raising one hand up. I lowered my gun and I breathed a sigh of relief. Torres, I said. You made it. Why didn't you use your comms? 
And Torres stood up and approached me, glancing over my shoulder. Where's that thing? Is it still around? You didn't answer my question. I sternly said. He looked at me and said, That thing busted my radio. I could hear you guys, but I couldn't talk back. I see. Listen, that guard from before is in the basement. We gotta pick him up and evacuate. Pick him up? Are you out of your mind? He scoffed. Torres got inches close to my face and said, Did you see what that thing did to Jones? Our bullets barely did anything to it. This situation is bigger than the two of us. You can leave if you want, Torres, but I need to get intel from him. We don't know how serious this situation is, I said. Torres shook his head in disbelief. Just then, another loud crash came from somewhere upstairs and both Torres and I looked at the ceiling. He looked down at me and said, All right, fine. Let's get the intel from the guard. But after we do that, we get out, all of us. No heroics. You got it? Understood, I nodded. Torres took point and I contacted Bryant in the meantime. Bryant, I found Torres. He's alive. Seriously? Brian said. That's great. Now pick up the guard and get out of there. That thing is back on the second floor now. Roger. Torres and I went downstairs to the basement, and I felt a lot better now that I had another teammate on my side again. Although I had survived lots of missions as the last man standing, a lot of it was luck based, and as much as I hated thinking this way, it felt relieving to have somebody who could potentially take the heat off you or be in the center of attention for hostiles. I didn't even think about it until later, but had it been me that the monster grabbed instead of Jones, I wouldn't be here writing this right now. Despite all of this, the mission always came first, and we were trained not to think about the potential risk for our lives, otherwise we could lose our cool and fail the mission or get killed. I saw the sign lab above the door at the end of the basement, so Torres and I took positions to breach it. He kicked the door down and I burst inside with my gun raised, closely followed by my partner. The lab was relatively small, a few rows of desks, a big shelf full of various chemicals and a closet. The room itself had a window near the top which led directly outside. It was obvious that the only possible hiding post for the guard was the closet. Come out. We're with the company, I said, pointing my gun at the closet. Nothing happened. Hey, don't make us drag your ass out of there, Torres said. A moment later, a voice came from the closet. All right, all right, calm down. The door opened and the guard we saw on the camera stepped forward. He was very young, in his early twenties maybe, and looked pale as a sheet of paper, his eyes wide in fear. You're here to rescue me? He asked. Yeah. Tell us what happened so we can get out of here, I answered. Wait, no, we can't leave yet. Not until we kill the mother in the biology and genetic study center, the guard quickly recited. What are you talking about? Torres asked. You've seen that thing out there, right? There's more of them. The small ones aren't that dangerous, but they grow fast and their skin becomes tough as hell, and they're all over the campus. They've already killed the four other guards. All the more reason for us to get out and let the big guys handle it. They'll be here in about an hour. Let's move. I said, and I was about to get going, when the guard spoke again. You don't understand. We can't wait for backup. By the time they come, these things will be all over the place and in even greater numbers. They'll reproduce extremely quickly and if we don't stop it, it's not just the campus that's going to be in trouble. Torres and I gave each other contemptuous glances before we looked back at the guard. Tell us everything, I said. The guard started pacing around and said, one of the professors here ran a project with his assistant and a group of volunteering students. 
It was an extremely secretive project, so much that the students were threatened they'd get kicked out of school for disclosing any information. It was called the Fertility Project. So how do you know about it then? Because the experiment's gone wrong and the whole thing is now out of control. Listen, we don't have time for this. I'll tell you everything, but right now, we gotta get to the biology center and... A loud sound of glass breaking resounded in the room and a long, emaciated hand reached in through the window. It grabbed the guard by his head and lifted him up from the ground effortlessly. The guard screamed and squirmed, but the hand seemed to grip him firmly like a vice. Torres and I opened fire on the unseen creature, and almost as soon as we did, it screeched, similarly to the creature back in the hallway. It instantly let go of the guard who fell down and scooted away to the opposite wall. The hand pulled back out of the window and a set of footsteps running away was heard just outside. Another scream came, but this one inside the building. Brian's voice came in. It's coming down. Get out of there. A second later, we heard that same gut-wrenching set of footsteps. But this one was rapidly approaching and the classroom door swung open. In front of us stood a tall, pale, humanoid creature. That's the best way I can describe it. It was so tall that I wondered how it got in, since the top of the door frame was under its head, even though it was hunched over. It had a face which resembled a human's, but was distorted with tiny, uneven eyes. A crooked mouth and a jaw that looked like it was broken in places. Thin black strands of hair protruded from its head. Its body was thin, emaciated even, so much that I saw its ribs prominently against its stretched skin. The arms were disproportionately long, almost reaching to the ground, with enormous hands at the ends. The legs were equally skinny and ended in large, flat feet that instantly made me wonder how the hell it could run so quickly. As soon as the creature got in, it looked to its left at the guard against the wall. It opened its mouth and screamed, revealing rows of blackened, jagged teeth. It grabbed the guard by his arm, who started screaming as well, and Torres and I opened fire, but the creature barely even flinched from the impact of the bullets. Moreover, it looked like the creature's flesh was so hard that bullets didn't even penetrate the skin. It swung the guard and slammed him on the floor effortlessly, as if he were no more than a bag of feathers. The guard instantly went silent as his head hit the floor, but was still conscious. The creature didn't stop there though, and swung and slammed the guard again with a sickening crack. It kept doing so, each time leaving a slightly larger stain of blood on the spot that it would hit. By the time it was done with the guard, his skull was dented in, and his body a bloody mess of unnaturally twisted extremities. It dropped the guard's body on the floor and then turned its attention to us, letting out another heart-wrenching scream. It charged at me at a speed I couldn't comprehend and grabbed me by my torso, raising me up. I instinctively drew my knife, and since it held me close enough, I stabbed the thing in the chest. The knife penetrated its skin easily all the way to the hilt, and the monster immediately let me go and screamed even louder this time, flailing its arms frantically around the room. Torres and I kept our guns trained as the creature's scream slowly got weaker, until it stopped altogether and the monster fell on its side, wheezing shallowly. We carefully approached it, and before it took its last breath, it looked at me one last time and then closed its eyes. Torres gave it a kick to see if it would get back up, the creature didn't respond to the kick and instead lay there motionless. Son of a bitch, you did it, Torres said, lowering his gun. I knelt down and I grabbed my knife, pulling it out with ease with a squishy sound. The blade was covered in black blood. I was surprised at how soft the skin was around its chest. So to test my theory, I tried stabbing it in the abdomen and sure enough, the knife's tip barely grazed the skin. It felt like trying to stab a piece of rock with a thin layer of leather over it. I guess its chest was its only weak spot, 
I said, examining the wound where I had stabbed it. The guard said there's more of them, but the one that broke the window looked smaller. Torres interjected. You think so? I wiped the blade on the monster and stood up. Brian's voice came in. Guys, are you alright? We're fine, I responded. Neutralize the hostile, but there's more of them. I know, I see them on the cameras. They're all over the place. Torres stared at the creature for a moment in silence, until I had turned to him and said, I know you probably think we should fall back and wait for backup, but we don't have that much time. We need to stop this thing from spreading. Torres nodded determinately and said, You're right. If they really grow as fast as the guard said, imagine what will happen if we have dozens of hundreds of them on our hands. I contacted Brian's again and said, Brian's, we need to find the Biology and Genetics Study Center. Can you see it on the map? Hold on, Brian said. Yeah, it's just southwest of your position. Should be a big blue building. I'll meet you there. Wait, before you do, I need you to contact HQ and ask them about the Fertility Project. The Fertility Project? What's that? No time to explain. Do it and meet us in front of the building. Roger that. I gave Torres a pat on his shoulder and turned to the door saying, Let's go kill that mother. The walk towards the Biology and Genetics Study Center was uneventful. And Torres and I thought we heard rustling in the bushes on occasion, but nothing came out after us. When we arrived to the front of the building, I contacted Brian's via comms again. Brian's, give me a sit rap, I said. Just got intel from HQ. On my way to you now, he said. Any hostiles around your area? Negative, all clear for now. Just a minute later, we saw Brian slightly jogging down the pavement towards us. He stepped in front of us and said, It's good to see your bow still in one piece. We're in deep shit over here. Well, we assume so. Torres interjected. So what's going on? HQ better have a damn good reason for keeping us in the dark like this. Brian sighed and started. They do. The truth is, they have no idea what's going on either. Here's the full story. The company signed a contract with the college when Professor Richard started the so-called Fertility Project. The purpose of the project was to impregnate women who were deemed infertile or unable to bear children for some other reason. But the problem is, HQ has no idea what the hell these creatures are, and neither does the college and they're the ones who funded the project. The project was top secret, yeah, but all the relevant info was disclosed to the company. Unless it wasn't, I said. Brian's continued. HQ suspects Richards is hiding something. The guards at the campus have pretty mundane duties, except for the guards stationed here in this building. His main job was to prevent anybody from entering it, and especially Richards' office where he kept all his research data. HQ also knows for a fact that the experiments were conducted inside the building, on the basement floor, where only Richards and other project participants have access through his office. So what does HQ want us to do? I asked. Eliminate Richards and destroy his data, along with anything relevant to the project, including the entire experimental lab. That's a direct order given by the client, or should I say the college, to the company. How the hell do we do that? Torres asked. I'm glad you asked, Brian smiled, and reached out behind his back. He brought forth a C4 explosive, which he promptly put back. Alright, let's move then, I said. We reached the doorway and found ourselves in a similar hallway to the one in the science building but this one was a lot dirtier. The floor seemed to be covered in some sort of greenish brown muck. It was dry in most places, but still sticky and wet in some. 
Richard's office is on this floor, the west side, Brian said. He didn't even finish that sentence when we heard a sudden scream somewhere in the building. Out of the corner at the end of the hallway, a silhouette peeked its head, staring curiously at us. The creature then came into full view, and what I saw resembled that of the big creature that had killed Jones and the security guard, except it was a lot smaller, the size of a toddler perhaps. It screamed, much like its adult version, the sound of screeching car tires permeating the building, but with a lot less intensity and noise. We managed to silence it halfway through its screech, with just a few bullets but we were too late. Dozens of screams filled the building and instantly, on our floor and the ones above, we heard hundreds of tiny footsteps running all over the place. In seconds, they started to appear from around the corner down the hallway. Dozens of creatures like the one that we had just killed, and they all shrieked as they ran towards us. My team and I opened fire immediately, and all of them fell pretty easily, unlike the big one we saw back in the science building. More and more kept showing up, closing in, as the building was filled with a cacophony of bullets being fired, and the creature's blood-curling screams. I was about to shout to my teammates to fall back, afraid that we would run out of ammo, but just as quickly as the screams had started, they had baited and only a few stragglers remained, running over the corpses of their brothers or sisters trying to reach us, despite not ever having a chance of doing so. Torres shot the final one, and the screams completely stopped along with the bullets, filling the building with unnerving silence. You see any more of them? I asked, not putting my gun down. That's all of them, Brian said as he reloaded. The hallway was filled with dozens of bullet-riddled corpses of child-sized, freakish monsters strewn over each other, the green much mixed with their dark blood making the gruesome scene look like a mass tomb. Carefully, we stepped over the bodies and proceeded to the west part of the building, into Richard's office, which greatly contrasted the rest of the building, with expensive-looking drinks in the cabinet, trophies on the walls, etc. There was an electronic door on the other side of the room beyond the desk, which led downstairs and it had a gaping hole in it, the den protruding towards the office, indicating that the creatures must have broken off from the inside. In the corner of the room against the wall was the unmistakably mutilated body of Richards. That our guy? I asked. It looks like him, Torres said as he knelt down to inspect him. No reason for anybody else to be here. There is a PC on the desk and despite the room being in a mess and the monitor being overturned, it still worked. I sat by the desk and I turned the monitor upright. The PC was unlocked and displayed the desktop screen. Really? Not even a password? Torres asked. I guess he didn't have time to log out, Brian said. There is a folder right in the middle of the desktop called FP. The Fertility Project, I'm guessing. I double clicked it and there were various files inside, including documents. I opened the first one and it said, The Fertility Project. The purpose of the project is to fertilize females which were otherwise deemed infertile. The project is still in its early stages and purely experimental, and does therefore not guarantee any results. Furthermore, adverse effects have not been 100% eliminated and may be visible in some subjects. Due to this, all participants, including test subjects, are under a strict obligation to sign an NDA, under risk of a federal violation in case they disclose any sensitive information. The subjects consist of five women between the ages of 20 to 28, who are unable to bear children and have signed up as volunteers. They will remain in the facility for the duration of the project, three months if unsuccessful, 12 months if able to conceive. During this time, my assistant and the 12 students who volunteered for the project will run daily tests on the subjects. The entire project has been funded by the college. Well, I'll be, Brian said. I, I wonder what happened to those women. I opened the next document, which had a timeline of the events. 
It said, Day 1 Subjects introduced to facility, each subject injected with a different strain of redacted. Changes should occur within 14 days. Day 2 No visible changes. Day 7 Subject 2 and Subject 4 have unexpectedly died overnight. I have disposed of their bodies and told the other participants that they resigned from the project and were let go. Day 9 Out of the five subjects, two, Subject 1 and Subject 3, were tested positive for pregnancy. This is a breakthrough in science and could solve the lifelong problem of infertility among married couples and otherwise. Day 21 Pregnant subjects' weights have rapidly increased, along with the size of the abdomen. The pregnancy seems to be progressing a lot faster than we anticipated, as the ultrasound is displaying the growth of the fetus, the likes of which was not expected to be seen before the third trimester. Day 26 Subject 1 has died at approximately 1.03 am. The rapid growth of the baby has gone out of hand as the subject's stomach was ripped open from the inside. The baby died shortly after and upon examination. Physical deformities became apparent. There is a picture under the text which showed the dead body of a baby on a hospital bed. But not just any baby. It was one of the deformed creatures that we had seen earlier. Shit, man, Torres said. I scrolled down. Day 27 Subject 3 has given birth to her baby via C-section, just like Subject 3. Subject 1's baby displayed physical deformities and an inability to breathe on its own. It was put inside an incubator, and it will continue to be monitored. Day 31 Subject 3's baby has displayed signs of rapid growth, reaching the weight of 23 pounds in just 4 days. It has also grown in size and has therefore been put into a bigger incubator. Day 40 The baby continues to grow, surpassing 8 feet in height and almost 400 pounds. That is not the only peculiar thing about it though. Upon running the scan, it was revealed that the baby has its own baby growing inside the stomach. It has therefore been dubbed the mother. The funds provided by the college are not sufficient anymore. But if I ask for more, they will require strong proof of why it's necessary. I have no doubt they will shut down the project if they saw what was going on here, but I can't stop now. So instead, I'll provide my own funds in secret. Day 52 The mother has already given birth to three other babies, each of them deformed even more than itself. It is still unable to breathe on its own and must therefore remain inside the incubator. But more and more fetuses seem to be forming inside of it. Day 67 The mother's babies have displayed at the same patterns as her, giving birth to their own babies at a rapid pace. The babies dubbed the rejects can grow enormously, surpassing humans in size and physical prowess. When they're juvenile, their skin is as soft as ours, but as they grow, their skin toughens, starting from the tips of their fingers and toes, until it reaches the area around the chest and heart. Once their skin is toughened completely, it becomes nearly impossible to kill them. However, further tests are needed. Another peculiar thing is that the mother seems to be able to communicate with her children, despite not having any visible form of communication. Either way, the project has been deemed a success and will therefore be shut down tomorrow, with everyone but the mother terminated. The mother will be sent to Redacted for further study, where I will personally lead the testing. Although the initial goal of the fertility project has been achieved, the results cannot be used with civilians for conception, and will therefore instead be used as an arms trade on the black market. The assistant, subjects, and participating students will be disposed of to prevent any risks of sensitive data being leaked. The document ended there. Well, screw me sideways, what a piece of shit, Torres said. 
Something must have gone wrong before they could terminate the project in the rejects. I said. We have to check out the experiment downstairs. I could see Torres' protest on his face, but he knew we had to do this. Brian nodded as well, then we wasted no time. I entered through the hole in the door first, and my teammates followed. The basement stairwell was dark, illuminated only by our flashlights and the now dim glow of the PC monitor from the office. But as we got down, we reached yet another busted door, which emitted a greenish glow from inside. Carefully, we stepped inside and gasped in awe at the sight before us. In front of us was a big room, very tall and very spacious, and on each side of the room were long rows of giant incubators that looked like upright tubes, filled with green liquid. At the very end of the room stood a much larger incubator, at least three times the size of the other tubes. A behemoth of a creature was dormant inside, only visible as a silhouette from here. The mother, I thought instantly. Each tube had lights inside which gave off this thickly green glow, reflecting it on the walls and floor, even bathing me and my teammates in green. A lot of the test tubes had deformed, emaciated creatures of various sizes and shapes inside of them, who looked to be dormant and unaware of our presence, but most of the tubes were empty with broken glass and green liquid spilled out of them on the floor. Guess we now know what happened here, Brian said. How the hell did the college fund something like this, without knowing it was happening right under their noses? Torres asked. You read the report, I interjected. Richards used his own funding, in addition to the college's. Let's check out that tube at the front. That might be the mother. We proceeded down the room, carefully observing the remaining intact tubes around us for any sudden movements. As we got closer, the mother became more and more clear. A creature which easily towered over 12 feet despite being hunched over. Its body was emaciated, except for the stomach which bulged prominently. The arms were disproportionately long, almost reaching down to the creature's ankles and the face. Despite having a breathing mask over its mouth, its face was clearly as deformed as that of its children, with a bulging, lumpy forehead and a thin strands of long black hair floating in the tube's green liquid. Her eyes were closed and even from there, the skin of the creature seemed thick and scaly like a crocodile's. I knew there was no way we could kill this thing with bullets, so I hoped the C4 would be enough to blow her into smithereens. Brian, let's set up that bad boy and get the hell out of here, Torres said. Brian's gladly whipped out the C4 and placed it on the tube. Almost as soon as the explosive had touched the glass, the mother opened her eyes, fixating her penetrating gaze on Brian's. And then the sound of glass breaking behind us filled the room. We turned around to see the creatures crawling out of the tubes, producing gurgling noises as the liquid poured out of their mouth. We instantly opened fire, mowing down the creatures that pathetically tried to crawl out of their tanks. But then another sound of glass breaking occurred, this time from the mother's tube. I turned around just in time to see the mother firmly holding Taurus by the torso like a toy, lifting him up with ease. By then, all of her children in the room were already dead, so we focused our attention to the mother, opening fire on her. As expected, the bullet simply bounced off as we watched in horror. As Torres started screaming more and more, the mother's grip on him tightening like a vice. We continued shooting relentlessly, and for an instant, the mother's grip on Torres loosened, and then she squeezed again, forcefully and quickly this time, crushing Torres' body and instantly killing him. She threw his limp body across the room and she would have hit me and probably crushed me with the impact had I not evaded it. Fall back! I shouted to Brian's and we started running for our lives. A very deep, very loud groan resounded in the room, making the walls vibrate. We heard the sound of something wet and heavy slapping the ground and I turned around for a moment, enough to see the mother feverishly crying towards us on her palms, with a glint of pure hate in her eye 
We ran back up the stairs and I went through the gap in the door first, turning around to see if Brian's was following me. He was just about to get out as well when the bony hand of the mother wrapped around him. He tried breaking free, but he must have realized that he was done for, because right before he got dragged back down to the dark stairwell, he threw the C4 detonator to me. Go! He shouted as he got pulled down. I grabbed it and I knew there was no point in trying to rescue him. I ran as fast as I could and then I heard the groan of the mother once more, spurring me to run even faster. As soon as I was about one step out of the building, I detonated the explosive, causing an alarmingly loud bang inside the building. I kept running as I listened to the building crumbling behind me with a progressively louder noise until it was almost deafening. Only when I was at a safe distance, I stopped and turned around to face my masterpiece of ruination. The building was completely collapsed and all that remained was a pile of rubble and debris. I leaned on my knees, exhaling in relief, and then I heard something moving in the debris. I looked up and sure enough, there was something stirring under. In seconds, a giant, dust-covered hand popped out, propping itself clumsily on the rubble. And then the other hand. The debris started shifting in large quantities, and the head of the mother slowly arose, groaning, now with such hate and anger that it looked like it could swallow the entire world. She made one step forward with its hand, and then braced itself with the other, slowly but surely pulling herself out of the rubble. I raised my gun, trying to aim for its eyes, and just before I pulled the trigger, another deafening explosion occurred. I felt the heat of the blast even at this distance as the missile hit the mother. She screamed in agony this time, but also recoiled in visible fear. Another missile and I heard someone shout, Get to cover! I did as they ordered and as I turned around, I saw the APC, which brought us here, pull up and unload at the thing mercilessly. There were dozens of other APCs and even two tanks. From what I could see, and they were all giving the mother a barrage of missiles and bullets. The mother groaned and flailed her arms, as if trying to swat at pesky mosquitoes. But gradually, her scaly skin had started to get bruised and then bloody. And then when her skin was soft enough, the armored infantry of the company ran in and started shooting at the weak spot at her chest. I joined in and I fired at the creature with the anger of a man whose entire unit was gruesomely killed, not holding back. The mother screamed and spun around, trying to retreat now, but her screams faded away and she miserably fell back on top of the debris, breathing out her last breath. Hold your fire, someone shouted. And then there was silence. A few armored security personnel hesitantly approached the dead giant and confirmed that she was dead. Before the commander started shouting various orders to his units on what to do next. When he was done, he approached me and asked, Where is the rest of your unit? KIA, I responded. We didn't know what we were up against. And yet you're somehow still alive. Again. He said behind his helmet mockingly. I didn't respond. He grunted and said, Mission complete. You did well. You should go back to report to HQ. Leave the cleanup to us, survivor.